It is a pleasure today to introduce to you two of the dominant figures of evaluation and the growth of the discipline of evaluation in the world. Both of these men are longtime supporters and advocates of IFDET. They uh, have also been supporters and advocates for good evaluation throughout the world. And it is an honor to once again have them with us. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Niels Dobelstein, who has worked in development for more than 30 years. Uh, he has uh, done a lot of work. The bios, I guess, are on the table. Uh, he has been the head of the, uh, the DAC evaluation group for quite a while. And uh, he has been a faculty member here at, at IFDET, Niels, eight years? Is it eight, nine, eight or nine years that Niels has been coming as uh, uh, one of our colleagues here at IFDET. He also, for a number of years, headed the evaluation unit in um, Danida, the Danish evaluation group. And he has been innovative in his work, he has been innovative in his writing, and he has been innovative in seeing linkages and possibilities for research and evaluation across the world. Uh, it's, just, it's just great to have him. And so I think what I should do is introduce Niels and then let him speak, and then I will introduce our second speaker after Niels is finished. May I ask you please to join with me in giving a warm, if that welcome, to Niels Dobelstein. Thank you, Ray, for this uh, overly positive introduction. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think you, you must think I have something important to say, because this is the third luncheon speak I have on the same subject, evaluation of the Paris Declaration. Uh, and while you said you would introduce Michael Patton a little later, I will say a word about his role here today, uh, because uh, we have done an evaluation of the Paris Declaration uh, but he's done an evaluation of the evaluation, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Uh, actually, I wasn't even supposed to be here today. We had invited Bernard Wood, who was the team leader of the in independent evaluation team, to speak here. But fortunately or unfortunately, he had to go to Paris of all places to present the evaluation to the most important body uh, in this context, namely the working part in aid evaluation, which is preparing the Busan High Level Forum uh, this fall. So Bernard and I have uh, prepared this uh, presentation together. So I speak on his behalf. Uh, I've removed a couple of slides where I disagree with him anyway, so. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the basics on the evaluation. How did it look? How did we do it? Uh, give you the key findings just to give you a flavor. Uh, then a little bit about uh, what we call shop talk for evaluators. What were the challenges? Of conducting this huge evaluation, uh, and then I'll give you some sources of information and tools. The Paris Declaration, I guess 90% of you, all of those of you who work with development and development systems, knows about the Paris Declaration, a huge concerted effort to improve effectiveness of development assistance and development, uh, and its impact on development. What we have done is conduct, conduct an independent evaluation of how the efforts to improve aid effectiveness have actually played out. Has aid effectiveness improved, and has that led to improved development? Uh, the background for the evaluation is primarily that the declaration itself, and it's unique in that sense that the declaration had set uh, indicators for achieving its objectives. Uh, it had set up a monitoring system, and it had demanded an independent evaluation of its implementation. So we are mandated by the declaration itself to evaluate it. Uh, and it is in itself a tool for mutual accountability. Uh, it is a fully joint and very transparent evaluation. Partner countries were involved in the process from the very beginning. 
uh, and I think that's important. It's taken us a little more than four years. We've done it in two phases. A first phase that fell in, uh, fed into the Accra High Level Forum in 2008, where we basically look at change of behavior of donors and partner countries. And now this second phase, which, well, we're, as, we're, we're so near completion that I can tell you that the report came from the printers last Friday on 1st of July. Uh, uh, but we're presenting it to the working partner aid effectiveness this week and going on to Busan later on. Uh, the basis for the evaluation is 22 country evaluations uh, led by the partner countries themselves conducted in country uh, and managed in country. 18 studies of donors and multilateral agencies at headquarter level and seven supplementary studies of thematic uh, issues that were not covered adequately in the country studies. So it's a huge amount of information and data that we have been building on and just giving you a brief schematic uh, overview of it, saying that the phase two evaluation builds on, of course, the first phase, uh, and then, as I said, the donor studies, the supplementary studies, but the core, the core are the 22 country evaluations. That is where we can really observe what has happened on the ground and what results have been achieved. Uh, I'm just going to go thr quickly through these very uh, technical slides, but just giving you an indica indication of the geographical coverage of phase one, donors and partner countries and multilateral agencies. Phase two, you can see we have a much better geographical coverage. And in phase two, we got a couple of big ones like the US and Japan to join us. Uh, and we had the African Development Bank joining us too. Just a parenthesis here, two major players you don't see here are the World Bank and the European Commission. Uh, who did not participate in a donor headquarter level studies. They were examined, evaluated at country level, but we didn't get the flip side of the coin uh, for those two huge agencies. The evaluation was overseen by an international reference group comprising more than 50 agencies, chiefly the 22 developing countries that participated in the evaluation, the traditional donors club, the DAC members, uh, CSO representatives from both North and South. Uh, it was co-chaired by Malawi and Sweden. Obviously, you can't manage such an uh, enterprise uh, by committee, so we had a smaller management group of only seven, and we had uh, to do the actual day-to-day -day managing contracting, finance and management and so on, a small secretariat that deliberately was placed uh, in an independent research institution, so it was not attached to any individual donor. Although I come from a donor background, uh, I think I managed to maintain my integrity uh, throughout this process. In each country, we had a national reference group comprising major stakeholders in development, meaning the government, CSOs, and major donors. Um, and we had a national uh, evaluation coordinator um, who commissioned the evaluation, who managed the national teams. And we had a core evaluation team which had two tasks. One was to uh, design uh, the uh, methodology for the country evaluations to support the countries in conducting these evaluations, and in the end, to synthesize the findings of these evaluations. It's a double role, and it has some implications, and I'm sure Michael will talk to that uh, in his presentation. Uh, and we had, uh, apart from the uh, evaluation of the evaluation, which Michael did, we also had two peer reviewers, uh, political figures, who looked at the uh, evaluation from with a political perspective of its political utility, and they were Mary Henry Hess and Mark Mallet Brown, who I think will be known to, to most of you. Basically, the evaluation asked three questions, very simple questions. What are the factors that promotes or inhibits implementation of the Paris Declaration? What and how has the Paris Declaration implementation to the extent it's taking place led to more effective development and development assistance? And thirdly, has that produced better results on the ground? Three very simple questions. Uh, they were transformed into a lot of sub-questions, I can tell you that, uh, but I'm not going to get into those details. But basically, these are the questions we asked, and these are the key messages that came out of the evaluation. First of all, and I think that has come to a surprise, as a surprise to many, that Actually, the evaluation is relatively positive in its findings. That 
that the parent declaration has contributed to a change of behavior, both amongst donors and amongst partner countries, more among partner countries than among donors. Partner countries have internalized the principles of the Paris Declaration to a much higher degree than have donors because it suits them in their development efforts, not just in uh, development assistance cooperation, but in development generally. Donors have been much slower uh, to adapt to the Paris Declaration. It has contributed to aid effectiveness, in increasing aid effectiveness, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, and thirdly, it has contributed to better development outcomes or results, but not across the board. We've only looked at health sector. We can say something positive about that, but we can't say much about other sectors. Um, I was presenting this to a group of CSOs last week in, in Copenhagen. And they said, well, we can't really recognize this positive picture. It can't be that good. And when you read the report, you find that it is not that good. Uh, but we have chosen in this evaluation to say, well, the glass is half full or nearly half full. It is not half empty or nearly empty. To give it that positive spin to say, well, the past declaration matters. It does make a difference if you implement it. So go ahead and implement it. And that's basically the message that comes out of the evaluation. If we had been very crashy, that it doesn't work, it doesn't help, it doesn't make any difference, then Busan would say, scrap it. Uh, and we don't want that because it is relevant, it is important. And that's what the fourth bullet here says. The main recommendations, I'm not going to go through all 11 of them, but they're very targeted. Uh, there are five to policymakers in partner countries and developing country and uh, donor agencies and multilateral agencies, and we have three for each of these two groups separately. So only 11 recommendations, and they're targeted to those who need to act on them. Uh, if questions and answers come up later, I, I may say uh, what they are, but you have a handout, a summary of the evaluation, so you can see them all there. An evaluation matrix was developed, applied, applying uh, 11 outcomes which are specified in the Paris Declaration and the ACRA agenda. And these were what we evaluated against. Uh, we had integrated quality assurance and peer review of the process all the way through. Uh, we, limited, we recognized the limits of aid in development and we applied a contribution analysis, not attribution analysis. We knew uh, we could not attribute these changes to any specific action, but we do have a plausible contribution analysis. We had a targeted program of support to national evaluation teams guide them through this uh, rather innovative approach. For many of them, it was an innovative approach, um, and we needed to support them uh, in, in carrying out their task. Uh, and we had a, uh, I've already hinted to that, a, a fairly well-functioning governance structure that, that uh, worked fairly smoothly. Key limitations, evaluating the effects of a political declaration, a political statement of intent, is not an easy task. You can't use your usual program project uh, evaluation approaches. Uh, another thing was that uh, the Paris Declaration was uh, instigated. It actually, it was never signed by anyone, uh, but they kind of, what, what do you call that, supported it or endorsed it. Um, and in only in, 2000, in March 2005. So what the evaluation did was actually covering uh, more or less like the period from 2000 till 2010 knowing that a lot of the changes that the Paris Declaration uh, promoted or propagated were actually underway in many countries before 2005. Uh, a weakness, and that I think was a, was a real weakness, that m most of the country studies were just shying back from uh, coming up with concrete data on donor uh, and multilateral performance. Uh, we really wanted them to shame, name and shame, uh, but they didn't, only in a few cases. And that we didn't get enough data on that. Uh, so in a sense, uh, some of the findings become rather generalized, and not to my mind, not specific enough. Um, but that's uh, what it was. And some have argued that the self, the uh, voluntarism of developing countries' participation is a limitation. It is to some extent, but if you look at the map before, you can see we have a fairly good geographical spread. We've got small countries like Cook Islands with 25,000 inhabitants and Indonesia with 250 million. 
We've got low-income countries like Malawi. We've got middle-income countries like Colombia. Uh, we've got uh, fragile states like Afghanistan. Uh, we don't have a representative sample of the world, but we have a fairly good sample. Uh, I got two more slides, but I'm leaving them because I know that uh, we'll be talking about it. Michael will be talking about that. And if he misses some of the point, we can pick them up later on. I'll just go to that one here and tell, just show you where you can find information about the uh, evaluation. Uh, and now this is one of the websites where you can find everything about evaluation. And if you just click on here, you can choose your language, click on English. You can choose your country you want to see the report, your study. So I clicked on Bolivia. Yeah, you can see the Bolivia country report. You can see the executive summary of Bolivia report. And you'd have an interview with a national coordinator from Bolivia talking about the evaluation and what it meant to them in Bolivia. Thank you. Niels, thanks very much. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the foremost authorities in the world on the Paris Declaration. Um, and a number of things in that presentation I think were, were most informative and we'll move forward. By the way, did you pick up on the fact that they use contribution analysis, not attribution? Right? Remember? Okay, we have got Terry Smutilo here who has been doing a lot of work on contribution. And you have also heard John Main, who is, in a sense, the godfather of contribution analysis. So we're, you know, these guys are, are right in the, uh, in, in the right groove. Now, let me present to you Michael Patton. Michael Patton has been with IPTET all 11 years. Uh, he has, each of those years, taught the qualitative methods course and now has added a second course on development developmental evaluation with his new book that's been out now about a year. It's a, a, a real honor to have him here. Michael is the former president of the American Evaluation Association and he has uh, received a number of awards from that association. And as uh, Niels just said, Michael was in charge of evaluating the evaluation. So it's a distinct pleasure, and please let us warm, warmly welcome Michael Patton. I'm delighted to be back in Ottawa with you uh, again this year for um, uh, this important topic. Um, Hopefully, evaluation of evaluation is something that uh, interests all of you. It is sometimes called the Evaluators Full Employment Act. Um, there can now be an evaluation of the evaluation of the evaluation and sort of an infinite regress uh, to make sure that there's enough work for all of us to do. Um, but it's, it's not to be taken for granted. Um, Ray, uh, Linda mentioned this morning that uh, the African Evaluation Association has scheduled their next meeting. Uh, at the meeting in uh, Niger two years ago, there was a session on evaluating uh, policy agreements. And uh, about 25 people came to it. I was one of the co-facilitators of that session. Um, and it was about the, the general topic of of countries or uh, international groups are constantly holding conferences where the conferences end with adoption of some kind of resolutions. They may be very important global kind of uh, things like the Kyoto Resolution on Climate Change or the Paris Declaration. Um, there, there was a uh, participant from a major African country there who interestingly uh, was in the president's office of his country with another person and their full-time job was to log in all of the agreements that the country was signatory to and estimated that they signed and agreed to about 600 uh, declarations of various kinds every year. They had no resources to do anything other than to register them 
a note if there was some report that they were supposed to file at some point, and they had a template to say, here is our report. Um, they simply changed, filled in the name of the agreement, and if they had to re-up it, they said, we continue our support for this declaration. Uh, and that's all that occurred. Uh, so the very notion, as difficult as Neil said, that one would evaluate this um, kind of political statement in, in a genuine way is not to be taken for granted and, in, in fact, is, is quite rare. Um, that's part of the, of the context for this. And, in, indeed, the, the shifting ground of evaluating big, large kind of efforts as opposed to the projects and programs that evaluation historically has grown up in is part of what Niels has been one of the pioneers in. Um, he was the pioneer in looking at something as complex and difficult as the worldwide response to uh, the Rwanda genocide. And you see here that that, uh, that produced a number of volumes and a synthesis uh, report. Uh, those of you in the case study class uh, would do well to look at this as an early example of a comprehensive uh, case study of a situation. Uh, Niels was a pioneer in looking at the humanitarian response to the tsunami and uh, creating a synthesis report around that. So part of what you're seeing with the evaluation of the Paris Declaration and, and some of what attracted me to getting involved in the evaluation uh, of the evaluation was that this is a different unit of analysis than we've traditionally had. It's not a project, it's not a program, it's barely even a strategy. And yet these major uh, efforts uh, of humanitarian relief, uh, of world uh, declarations, uh, human rights declarations, different ways of doing things, uh, deserve the attention of evaluation. In 2005, the American Evaluation Association, the Canadian Society, sponsored, which uh, the two societies do every 10 years, an international gathering on evaluation. Um, the theme of the one in Toronto in 2005 was crossing borders and crossing boundaries. And in conjunction with that meeting, uh, based in part on the synthesis evaluation of Rwanda that Niels uh, and the colleagues were a part of, the, that conference and the two associations uh, gave the very first international award for speaking truth to power to General Romeo Dallaire, Lieutenant General uh, from Canada, who was in charge of the peacekeeping forces in Rwanda. And the associations gave that award to, to General Dallaire in recognition of the fact that while he didn't carry the label of evaluator, most of what he was doing uh, in charge of the peacekeeping forces there was filing daily reports about the situation and trying to get the world to pay attention to what was happening. And the world ignored those data. It is an example of reports gone unused. Um, and to call attention to that and to the high stakes that can be involved in the work that we're all involved in an evaluation. Um, this new international award, Speaking Truth to Power, was created and given to, to General Dallaire, who was at the, the meeting and told some of the story of, of Rwanda. Well, that's the context for the Paris Declaration evaluation, because the world powers around development aid will be in Busan at the end of this year. And this report is speaking truth to them about what's actually happened with this declaration that they've signed on to. How real has it been? Are they paying any attention to it? Are they doing anything with it? And you heard as Niels was talked about how they're positioning it, looking at whether the glass is half empty or half full. Uh, the first question is whether there's any water in the glass at all. Um, because for many of these kinds of big declarations, they're empty, completely empty. And what the Paris Declaration evaluation suggests, and one will debate whether it's half full or half empty, but there indeed is water in the glass. And how much varies by country, which is the beauty of different case studies. And again, uh, 
what they've made available in transparency is, as he just showed you, all the case studies are online. So anyone interested in case study evaluation can look at that. And all of the tools, all of the instruments, the matrix, the inception documentation, everything that was created as a part of this massive evaluation is already accessible to you. You can look at the original proposal and how it turned into the evaluation. You can look at this detailed matrix uh, that they created to, to create the framework for synthesis and analysis. All of that is being shared uh, with people. And there are a lot of good uh, materials there for our future evaluation work. So let me say a word about meta-evaluation itself. The, um, in addition to the DAC standards that, that Niels and uh, Ted and others have been so heavily involved in doing internationally, there have been the Joint Committee standards, the first set of standards generated around evaluation. Um, and in order to maintain a set of standards for a field, there is an International Association for Accreditation of Standards that sets the standards for standards the Full Employment Act for Standards Setters. Um, and they require that standards in a profession be reviewed at least every decade to stay uh, accredited by the Association of Standards. So the uh, Joint Committee on Standards has just gone through and just published uh, this year, the early, late last year, the latest revision, the third set of standards. The first set was done in 79 and 80. They were revised in the mid-90s, and now we have the third uh, set of standards that are in uh, five categories. It used to be four categories. The categories are utility, evaluations are judged by their use, feasibility, that they're realistic, prudent, and practical, uh, that they're ethical, that they are accurate. We've had that set of standards since the original set of standards in 1979. This latest revision added for the first time as a part of our professional obligation as evaluators an accountability group of standards that call for evaluating evaluations. Meta-evaluation is now one of the standards, both formative meta-evaluation, summative meta-evaluation, and overall accountability evaluation to hold evaluators accountable for whether or not we are operating according to the standards. The standards that guided this evaluation are the DAC quality standards for evaluation, and those are the standards that we used in doing the evaluation of the evaluation. In the handout that you have on the, the evaluation, you will see a audit statement written by me. This is the e meta-evaluation summary, and this is the equivalent in corporate accounting if you ever have read the annual report of a corporation, they routinely have an external auditor review the internal books of the corporation, and the job of the auditor is to say that the books have been kept in good order and that one can trust the numbers. The task of a meta-evaluator in that sense is to, this, to tell those who will use a report whether or not they can seriously engage with the data in the report. And part of what my, this audit statement says is that the Paris Declaration evaluation has been forthright and transparent about both the strengths and the weaknesses of the, the data, about the, the limitations of it. There are sections, um, and the slides that Niels didn't get a chance to show you are about the challenges and, and some of the additional limitations of doing this kind of work. Um, my charge from the management committee and the secretariat, in addition to, um, in the end, producing this audit report, was to look at um, lessons learned from this. And I've just pulled out a couple of these to, um, to share with you today. I wanted to go over three of them, what I think are really quite impressive lessons that emerge from the the complex evaluation of the Paris Declaration. The first is the way in which they managed the classic tension between stakeholder involvement and evaluator independence. We're going to come back to these. The second is the tension between strength of evidence and delivering the findings on time. 
And the third is the tension between country level ownership and utilities versus the need for an international synthesis. These classic tensions run through the Paris evaluation at every level. And in, in my judgment, they manage these um, as well as or better than any evaluations I've seen in the 40 years I've been in, in this work. These are tensions, they are not problems to be solved. They don't go away. There aren't solutions to these. They are inherent in the nature of the work. You don't make them go away. You have to decide how to handle them, what to do about them. Um, and so in, in that sense, the, the beginning of being able to manage them is to know that they're going to exist. The Paris Declaration governance structure, the, the management structure was established to deal with this very first tension. This is a, a graphic that tries to capture this tension between collaboration. We have 40 years of research on evaluation use that says use is enhanced by collaborating with primary intended users to ensure relevance, but we also have research and values and standards that claim for that evaluators need to be independent, that evaluations need to be independent to ensure credibility. And so we're trying to ensure relevance at the same time ensure credibility and these things end up being um, in tension with each other. One of the common classic questions that evaluation units in every government, in every international agency I've ever been involved in is how do you maintain independence while you interact with the people from whom you're going to get data and who are determining the questions and who hold the power. And the Paris Declaration governance structures are available, the detailed reports on how that was put together. The report itself describes this. They manage these tensions um, by establishing and managing the boundaries here, the things you see at the bottom, distinguishing input and advice from decision making and authority, establishing and maintaining trust among the major partners, acknowledging the tensions, intervening quickly when problems and misunderstandings arise. This occurred sometimes at the country level, uh, it occurred sometimes at the international level, and I observed the international reference group meetings, which was the stakeholder involvement processes, and the evaluation re team reports to that group, um, and watched the way in which this tension, as the draft findings would come forward, the international reference group meetings, a diverse global stakeholder community reacted to the findings. The evaluators gave response to those reactions, maintaining their final authority and responsibility to produce the report, but showing that they heard the concerns that were being uh, 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 voiced by the stakeholder group. In the final session of the International Reference Group in Copenhagen, um, watching this dance between independent and independence and stakeholder collaboration was, I think, a marvel of the highest level of engagement that I've seen in our field. Um, the messages from the stakeholders were very clear that they wanted more and more direct, clear, powerful conclusions and recommendations and the evaluators responding that they wanted to stay true to the data and close to the evidence. And that exchange of trying to figure out what could you actually say with the evidence, it was true to the evidence, but was also clear and hard hitting and would move the agenda of deliberation forward was a genuine negotiation between the independence of the evaluators and the engagement of a diverse stakeholder group with those findings. Um, in real time. There came a tense moment toward the end of that meeting where the evaluators had responded to the, what they had heard during those two days and made assurances that they would take those things into account in their final uh, draft, final version of the report. And the stakeholder group pushed back and said, but will we see this one more time before it's finalized? The time pressures were huge, as you'll see with the next point. But in the end, in um, some negotiations that had to go on at the last minute, the timeline was adjusted to give the International Reference Group one week of review for any final things that they wanted to say about the final version of the report. 
to take seriously this negotiation while at the same time always making it clear the evaluation report would be the evaluator's report, their conclusion, their judgments, their recommendations. Which brings us to this tension between strength of evidence and delivering the findings on time. Every one of the countries at some point asks for more time. Um, we always ask for more time. That's what we do as evaluators. Certainly there's a class at IPDIP on asking for more time. We always need more time to strengthen the evidence, get better data, get more time to analyze it. And yet the Busan meeting is scheduled. And Niels and Ted with the management group, the people who know how these things work internationally, know exactly when this report has to be published if it's going to affect that process. And when the country reports have to be done to be synthesized. And so you're working with all the usual procurements and difficulties of getting something done, but a commitment that if it's going to get used, it has to be done now. I, as the independent external evaluator, the evaluator observed the management group meetings where the international evaluation team and the management group negotiated the deadline and asked for more time and talked about the implications of not having more time. And the decision was we have to hold to the deadline formally, but informally, in a couple cases, we'll help people along. And so again, it was a matter of negotiation, looking at the big picture, but getting things done on time versus the rigor. This is a cartoon that I've adapted from Terry Smuko, who's created it for a number of the tensions in evaluation, walking the tightrope. Um, in this case, between increased rigor and getting things done in a timely fashion, which is critical for the synthesis to occur, but also to maintain country ownership. The 21 case studies, the donor studies that were done, each of those had to be owned by those groups, but working according to a, a, a standardized matrix that would allow the synthesis. And those tensions uh, had to be managed. And you see here, um, some of the tensions between this bottoms-up country process and a top-down standardized synthesis process that end up having to be uh, negotiated. This happens, again, across evaluation. It happens within countries where you've got different regional data and you need to get national data. It happens in international agencies where they've got country-by-country -country reports and need to get a, a global report. It's a standard tension. And in the, the Paris Declaration dealt with this, I think, in a, in a particularly admirable way. Um, three final lessons. The implications of being driven by attention to use. In this case, at the fourth high-level form. That affected the deadlines. It affected the way in which the, the synthesis was structured. It meant that they were utilization-focused throughout. We give a lot of attention to use. And in the latest book that I have, um, Mark Rogers, a cartoonist, gave me this wonderful cartoon that shows a director of an agency sitting in her office saying, I can honestly say that not a day goes by when we don't use these evaluations one way or another. Um, well, the entire PEST declaration has been directed at the policymakers who will meet in December in Busan and indeed, as I was having lunch with, with Niels about the dissemination strategy, this continues to follow through as they're not expecting to make a single presentation on the findings in Busan, but to create a set of short policy briefings where different sections of the report would be addressed to different groups that will be making decisions at the Paris Declaration uh, meeting. To, to fine tune the findings to discrete audiences that will be dealing with discrete parts of it, not expect them to absorb the entire report. That's really targeting use. This evaluation really showed the relevance of the DAC standards, and everyone in this room should know the DAC standards. You can Google them if you, if you don't, haven't seen them. Um, the final section of the Paris Declaration evaluation is a chart that takes every one of the DAC standards and shows how the Paris Declaration met and responded to those standards. It's a really revealing um, piece of the report, but it's also a template for how to treat standards seriously. Every single one of the DAC standards, they list as a matter of accountability how they dealt with it, where you would find 
that standard adhered to. And the final point that I want to make is the importance of these kinds of evaluation processes for the change process itself. We interviewed key informants from the countries, people involved in doing the case studies. Uh, we attended the international reference group meetings. We did a survey. And one of the things that's clear is that in the 21 countries that were part of the case studies, the people in those countries, the cabinet ministers in those countries, the NGOs in those countries, the donors in those countries, know a lot more about the Paris Declaration than those countries where the evaluation was not done. When an evaluation team in a country goes to meet with a minister of government and says, I want to interview you about what our country is doing about the Paris Declaration principles, and the minister says, what are the Paris Declaration principles? And then the evaluator has to explain them in order to interview them. The evaluation is having an impact on educating people about this very process. One of the major things we've learned in the last decade, one of the major conceptualizations in the field that we call process use, is the impact of doing an evaluation on the change process itself. So in these 21 countries, you have teams of people in those countries who have spent the last year and a half thinking about the Paris Declaration, interviewing people about it, gathering reports about it, talking about it, making presentations to cabinet about it. And so the evaluation itself is part of the change process and setting standards for what implementation means and discussing those standards becomes part of the process itself. And so we are all involved in helping people realize that a part of knowing what we're doing in the world, taking these processes seriously, speaking truth to power, is that we are getting people to think evaluatively even as they evaluate. This figure of the jester is the figure that I've adopted to represent an evaluator. You will may remember from your history that the jester in medieval times had the dangerous role of helping the monarch hear what was really going on in a way that the monarch could hear what was really going on without losing one's head. People surrounding monarchs or prime ministers or presidents or other powerful people um, have learned that those folks don't like to hear truth. They often surround themselves by people whose job is to keep the truth from them, to tell them what they want to hear. The job of the jester was to break through all of that and speak truth to power in a way that could be heard. That has been the underlying challenge of the evaluation of the Paris Declaration, is to speak truth to donors who have signed on to the Paris Declaration but aren't working according to it, to speak truth to country leaders who've said they're going to operate according to the Paris Declaration but are not doing so, and to help elevate this in a way that those deliberations can be genuine, data-based, evidence-based, and people can talk about what's really going on. In that way, we are all jesters, hopefully thriving in our role of helping folks understand what's really going on and valuing that commentary. With that, let me stop and invite questions or comments to either Niels uh, or I. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. This is really quite a profound gathering, and we have here two of the most, I think, thoughtful people in the, uh, in the world in terms of dealing with the issues of evaluation, and particularly now taking the conversation about use to a much higher level than simply how is my project going to be used. These men are talking about something that is global in its implications. We have enough time, I think, for three questions. Let's take one round of questions, then we have to break to go back to class. Could I see the, the microphone is here? We're going to ask you to come up and pose your question here so that the camera is able to see yourself. This is not meant to scare you or intimidate you. There's only we have to ask you to please come here to pose your question. Now, oh, all right. 
Ma Michael has sometimes pointed over there saying, uh, talking about Ted, the Ted. Uh, I just want to say, Ted, please, please stand up. On, Ted, Ted was with <laughs> He was with me on the management group for the land evaluation 15 years ago, and he's been co-chair of my management group on this evaluation. Yeah, good guy. And IPDET faculty, too. Anyone want to come forward with a question? There are no questions left? There are no questions? All right, just a moment then. We have to give. There are a couple challenges slides that Neil didn't have time to go through. Uh, yeah. If you want to take the time to, Let's do it. to do it. Uh, the, these are challenges that were formulated by the core evaluation team. Um, but I will say that I fully concur with all of them, but they're not my thinking, it's Bernard Wood and his team thinking. Uh, as he's saying that a fully participatory and yet independent process is possible, it is demanding on everybody involved, and it costs. Uh, it hinders, as Michael has said several times, on good government arrangements, communication, and support, but it also hinges on meeting. You couldn't do this in a virtual way, world. Uh, some have said this evaluation is bloody expensive. Yes, it is. If you've got to get people, and the International Reference Group, when we had uh, a meeting uh, on, on the draft report with the national team leaders, chairs of national uh, reference groups, and national coordinators, we were 130 people. And you bring people, 130 people together from around the world for four days to discuss something that's important, it costs money. Um, and I'm not blushing about that. We were also able to raise the money, so that was not the issue. Anyway, context is not just background. And I think that's a lesson that I have learned several times. You sometimes commission a background document. Just well, what's the history? What's uh, around here? Well, what is the context we're working in? But the context analysis is extremely important uh, to understand what are the uh, uh, supporting or limiting factors uh, on, on the development of what you're doing. Uh, finding the basic uh, program theory. Uh, I know, I guess most evaluators have been in a situation where they had to reestablish the logical framework of a particular program. In this case, we, uh, in a way, reestablished the program logic. Uh, the Paris Declaration has five principles. It has 56 commitments. It has 12 indicators. But what most people have overlooked, and the evaluation team found that, it's named 11 problems it was intended to solve. And what we did in the evaluation was we turned these 11 problems into targets, issues, did we solve those problems in implementing the Paris Declaration? And that was the basis for the matrix that was developed. And I think that was the genius of the team to, to find that. Uh, key common questions can be developed for most uh, cases, and then they have to be supplemented with uh, with issues that are also relevant to the particular case study, uh, in this case, the countries. It's an issue of, uh, as Michael said again, the tension between national ownership and utility and globalized uh, synth uh, synthesis. Make the common evaluation framework feasible for all. Uh, that was really a challenge. It was a demanding framework. It was a demanding matrix. Uh, we had assumed a sort of better capacity after 10 years of IPDET, uh, we thought that we had the capacity we needed at country level. We didn't. So we really had to support uh, partners uh, in, in, in the eva national evaluation teams in conducting the evaluation. Uh, and that really shone through when we talked about new approaches uh, to the evaluation. Contribution analysis is indispensable for change processes. You cannot attribute, as we've said it several times, uh, in this case, the need for a quick evaluation, although it took us four years, but in terms of time elapsed from the Paris Declaration in 2005 and delivery of this report in mid-2011 is extremely short to capture changes. Then you've got all the factors of delays, that's a challenge. Uh, I think Michael has elaborated them very well. Uh, but 
I think you alluded to it, but I think visibly ensuring and protecting the independence of the evaluation team. And that was really the job of the Secretariat and a management group. There were pressures on national evaluation teams, there were pressures on the international evaluation team. Everybody wanted their uh, kind of side of the story presented in their light, uh, but we had to manage those pressures and, and make sure that, and we did that from the very beginning when the terms of reference or the mandate for the reference groups, both international and national, their role was not any way decision making. It was comment, uh, assuring, but not approving. That was left to the management group uh, and the secretariat. And that was what I think ensured the independence of the team in the end, because they could have been brought under immense pressure. That's it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a rather extraordinary session here with us today for lunch. Please join with me to thank Niels and Michael. <laughs> really exceptional. Thank you both. Niels, thank you. Michael, 